Welcome to Inside Magazine. I'm David Matlin. Well, March 8th is International Women's Day, an occasion to reflect on the status of women around the world, on their rights, on the progress made, and the battles still to be fought to better conditions for women. Tonight, we chose to talk about the situation of hundreds of women in Israel who are unable to rebuild their lives after a separation from their spouses for one simple reason. Their husbands refuse to grant them the religious divorce. Divorces, just like marriages, depend on religious institutions that give the man, and the man alone, the ability to divorce. Given this power, some husbands even financially blackmail their wives under the complicit watch of certain rabbis. Hundreds of women officially remain married to their husbands, bound, as we say in Hebrew, by a marital commitment they no longer desire, without any ability to rebuild their lives. They cannot remarry, and the children they would conceive with another man would be considered illegitimate and not be recognized as Jews. It's a hardship that can last for years. Israeli divorce, a woman's fight to regain freedom. A report by Mael Benoliel for I-24 News. After two children, I said, stop. I don't want this anymore. I can't. He promised me he would change. I took it up on me and said, okay, let's make another attempt. But quickly, his real nature resurfaced. Obsessive, violent. He didn't care about anything, about religion or about his children. The only thing that mattered to him was himself. On top of that, he became jealous. It was no longer just physical violence. It was also psychological. The house became like a high-pressure cooker. The children were against him. He was really violent with them, and then they saw how he behaved with me, insults and humiliation. It was horrible, but in spite of it, I didn't know where to start, how to make him leave, how to divorce him. A year later, I understood I had to go to court to open a file. That's when I started the whole process, the worst thing that ever happened to me. In Israel, only 20% of the population is religiously observant. Yet while the country is subjected to parliamentary law, divorce, just like marriage, depends on the religious institutions and is subject to religious law. To divorce, one is obliged to go before one of 12 rabbinical tribunals. The rabbinical tribunal of Jerusalem is one of them. They are the ones who decide. They represent the Jewish law. For instance, when a couple comes here to get a divorce. And these judges, rabbis called Dayanim, who are mandated by the Israeli state, are the only ones allowed to grant a divorce. At the end of a traditional ritual, the man, and only him, divorces his wife by giving her a document written by a scribe on a piece of parchment, a document that voids the matrimonial rules between the spouses. A millennium-old act of divorce also called get. During the wedding, there's a mutual engagement of the husband toward his wife and of the wife toward her husband. As such, the wife cannot wake up one day and leave her husband like that. She committed to her husband when she got married. And if she wants to divorce him, she will need to obtain a get. It is the man who has to grant his wife the get. He's the one who frees his wife from her marriage commitment. But this doesn't work both ways. One grants and one is granted. How could it be otherwise? The man is the one who has to give a get to his wife because it is the way it is written in the Torah. A religious law subjecting the woman to her husband's will. Moria is a Jewish Orthodox woman. This mother is also a lawyer specializing in family law. During her career at Yad Laisha, she has followed a great number of divorce cases. Yad Laisha is an organization that helps women file for divorce. According to the Torah, in the supreme system that regulates and applies the law, only the man's agreement is required during the whole divorce process. If, for example, a man meets a woman prettier than his current wife, he can simply divorce her. This shows that the man is the only one with power in this system. But when the husband refuses to grant the get and prevents the divorce from being finalized, he forces his wife to remain bound by the law of marriage. Each husband who refuses to grant his wife that get has a good reason to do so. Some refuse as a form of revenge. You want to divorce me? I'll show you. 
or you cheated on me, I'll show you now, or for personal reasons. There are also those who count on the divorce to get rich, to get the bigger part of the couple's assets and belongings, or not to pay child support, for example. And then there are those convinced that their wives are going to come back to them, those who still really love their wives and who are not ready to accept the fact that they want to leave them. These situations are rather frequent in Israel. According to the Rachman Center for the Advancement of Women's Status of the Bar Ilan University, we have studied the women who got a divorce in Israel. And what we found is that one woman out of three who has gotten a divorce in Israel was pressured by her husband and risked not being granted the get. Another bit of data we gathered, one that's maybe even more worrying, is that the more religious a woman is, the less education she has and the more she risks not being granted the get by her husband. It concerns 50% of this category of women. And the number of women waiting for years before finally being granted their get is pretty high. Ten years, that's how long Sarah had to wait. A very painful and long experience that influenced her decision to testify today anonymously. My husband had refused to grant me the get for ten years. It was a very difficult period. Almost no one knew about it in my circle. Being neither divorced nor married, you are completely powerless. For example, you have to refer to your marital status everywhere. You are either married or divorced, and there's no third possibility. I didn't know to which category I belonged. A real nightmare for Sarah that doesn't stop here. Her husband then decided to flee abroad. He moved to the USA, leaving his wife, their four children, and a debt of hundreds of thousands of shekels behind. The court warned me that it would take more time because he fled abroad. They really didn't care about it. At the beginning, they took me seriously, like, we're going to give them two to three years to see what happens and maybe they'll manage to reconcile. That was their state of mind. Divorcing someone takes time. Time for the rabbinical tribunal to verify that the reasons given by the couple are admissible. In any situation, whether both the husband and the wife want to divorce or not, the first question we ask is, is there any chance that you could reconcile? As the rabbinical tribunal, our first will is to prevent couples from divorcing. But most of the time, couples never manage to reconcile, or the man keeps on refusing to grant the get to his wife. Many of them will even choose to flee rather than to get a divorce. Aware of this phenomenon, but without actually questioning the relevant law, the rabbinical tribunals have created a department to specifically deal with the hard cases. Yet again, the mediators often only intervene after several months. It took two years after filing for divorce for the rabbinical tribunal to act. After two years, they sent a rabbi to the USA to try to convince Sarah's husband to grant her the get. I called the rabbi when he came back to ask about the situation. He told me, listen, your husband is a hard man, but we will keep working. It will be okay, don't worry. What do you mean? He has granted me a get or not? But he had not. And Sarah's husband even attempted to blackmail her from abroad, a financial blackmail that he used the mediator from the rabbinical tribunal to exercise on his wife. It's not that the husband doesn't want to grant the get. He wants to, but it depends on financial matters between the husband and his wife. She's not flexible enough. I cannot do anything about it. Between us, give him 200,000 shekels and he'll grant you the get. At the very second he told me that, I felt like the sky was falling on my head. They were not ashamed to ask me for 200,000 shekels when they already owed me a million shekels. 
A divorce blackmail that has become rather common during a separation process, but Sarah refused to be pushed around. That's when I went to Yad Leisha and things started to change. At Yad Laisha, our goal is to help women get divorced with dignity. From our point of view, each Jewish woman has a right to put an end to her marriage at any moment in time without having to give up her rights or without the process taking too long. Because even if they rarely use these methods, the rabbinical tribunals' judges have non-negligible means to pressure the husbands. From passport confiscation and being shunned by the community to prison, they're the only ones who can decide. Sometimes the husband has to be punished for him to grant his wife the get. For example, there's a man who's been in prison for the past 14 years because the tribunal forced him to grant his wife the get and he refused. In Sarah's case, it took eight years of mediation, of dead ends and pressure by the association to get the husband to be shunned from the community, a solution that proved efficient. They finally decided to punish him by forbidding him to pray in synagogue, to eat with other Jews at the same table, or to even be talked to. It was all thanks to Yad Laisha. Without this organization, they would still be trying. Once these interdictions were published in synagogues in the U.S., he granted me the get the very next day. Like Yad Laisha, and because of the importance of the phenomenon, a great number of organizations have started to help all these women. After years of experience in fighting, they are trying to make their voices heard. Because for them, it is high time things changed. And Batya Kahana Dror, a devoted Jewish woman and a lawyer at the head of the Mavoy Satum, explained to us. It's not only because the man refuses to grant the get, it is also because the religious system allows him to do so. In a great number of cases, the woman ends up having no other choice but having to pay her husband. In fact, they buy their get, and this is one of the problems. A woman who has to buy her get to divorce her husband, to my knowledge, it is one of the biggest discrimination. The problem is that way too often the religious institutions don't go along with the democratic norms of a country. And we are fighting this because we want more equality and justice and less discrimination. In Israel, religion and the state are intrinsically linked, and so it's hard to separate one from the other. Frankly, I don't see how this can change. I think there are a lot of truth and good things in Jewish law. It just needs to be adapted to the modern world. And yes, there are things that need to be adapted. For example, to appoint new Dayanim to the rabbinical tribunals. More modern Dayanim who served in the army, that have academic backgrounds. Some Dayanim speak the language of the people and not the language of the temple. It could better the image of the rabbinical tribunals. I am against monopolization. A great majority of the Jewish people are traditional and want to get married according to tradition. They also want to divorce according to the Jewish rights. But why would that be their only option? That the state of Israel, a democratic and liberal state, has given absolute control to the rabbinical tribunals when it comes to marriage and divorce is at the very heart of the problem. And there lies the biggest discrimination against women. All these women end up being controlled by the rabbinical tribunals who are themselves controlled by a patriarchal system where the men have all the power. And I think it's repugnant, and I believe it should shake up all those who decide and who make the laws in Israel. Unfortunately, this is not yet the case. I think a complete separation between the religious institutions and the state is necessary. The Jewish law is not against women. It's the rabbis who are. They are the ones who are not flexible. It's a known fact. In my case, from the moment they decided to do something, they successfully did. Meanwhile, after a decade-long obstacle course, Sarah finally got her holy grail a few weeks ago, and she still can't believe it. That's wow, that's it, I'm free. 
I'm no longer bound to him. I can finally do whatever I want. It's just wow. Wow. That's all for this episode of Insight on International Women's Day. You can stay with us on our Facebook, Twitter, and of course on our website, i24news.tv. I'm David Matlin coming to you from the Jaffa Port in Israel. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week at the same time.